For those of us old enough to remember, and there's a generation, of course, that doesn't, there was a time when only amateurs represented Canada in international hockey. We all complained. The Soviets were pros. They got houses, they got jobs. If the NHL could play, they'd kill them 10 nothing in every game. The country's overconfident. The media was overconfident. Were the players overconfident? Uh, yes, we were. Uh, I mean, we knew they were a good hockey team, but look at the firepower we have. I mean, how, you look around the dressing room, how could we possibly lose? Because if you would have picked another 35 guys and played against the first 35, I think we would have won six of the eight games. And so, you know, just the firepower we had, I, I, I didn't think there was any way they could compete with us. I remember the big story was the goaltending. They, the scouts said they got no goaltending, and this guy, Trechak, can't stop a puck. Yeah, we heard that, and uh, that's why the Toronto Maple Leafs have not won the Stanley Cup since 1967. <laughs> it was the Toronto Maple Leafs scout that went over there. All right, you talk about the weak goaltending. You get up by a couple of goals in that first game in Montreal. I mean, you guys had to be sitting on the bench saying, this is 10 nothing." Au contraire. I scored the second goal. We went back to the bench, and I said to Ronnie Ellis and Bobby Clark, my two line mates, I said, this is going to be a very long series. Even being up 2 nothing, I, we, everybody on the bench knew that we had underestimated them. They were not overwhelmed by the way uh, I thought they would be. They broke every rule in the game. Uh, they went up the ice. They didn't like what they saw. They turned back. If you ever did that with Imlac, you were on the bench for a week. And uh, the reality is that their physical conditioning, I mean, I'd never seen guys in this kind of shape before. We knew we were in trouble. They've been uh, described as ballet on ice. Is that a, I mean, were, were you shocked when you saw the systems that were not yeah. uh, in, in use in the well, NHL? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the transition game was unbelievable. Like we had, I mean, teams in the NHL today have great transition games. We were just not used to that. We were in their end, and all of a sudden, our defense when we're fighting with our life to, to get back to try to stop a goal on the other side. And, and conversely, I, I felt sorry for Dryden, because every time he thought they were going to shoot, they passed. And when he thought they were going to pass, they shot. And I, I mean, we just were not used to it. And they came out as a unit of five people, and they'd been doing this for several years. And they were poetry on ice. I mean, they, their passing game was crisp. When they got into our end, I mean, they threw it around like, man, they just wouldn't give it to us. And of course, we weren't in good enough shape to... Uh, take them off it either. What surprised us, or those of us watching in person, was how tough they were. I mean, people today, younger people say, ah, they were pushed around. These guys, I know you were shocked, they were physically tough. Well, exactly. And they changed the game that it was played. I mean, European hockey was incredible. These guys lifted weights, they did everything. Uh, which we were just un we just weren't used to that. I mean, physically, they were stronger than we are. We were bigger but physically, they were stronger than we are. What do you remember about the Canadian fans? Uh, they certainly turned against you in Vancouver. Uh, Phil had to make that, uh, that impassioned plea after the game. Yeah, we had a bit of a pity party. There's no question about it. I mean, we were really trying. Uh, and Vancouver was not a good game for us. We just didn't seem to have any jump in that. And, I mean, Phil was our inspirational leader on and off the ice. One of the great speeches of all time. I, and when you see him, when I see it today, the sweat is pouring on. I'm disappointed. I'm discouraged. And, and I think that's when the Canadian people went, man, we got to get behind them. And, and then the Canadian people went crazy. We got bags of uh, postcards. There was, the walls were filled of telegram. I still have the one from Lucknow, Ontario. Your hometown. Uh, my hometown. Up near Kincard. Uh, exactly. And uh, of course, the 3,000 Canadians that came over there, they, they were incredible. They sang the national anthem like it's never been sung before, with such fervor and enthusiasm. You're sitting out there at center ice, and man, we got to do this. There were 12,000 Soviet fans. Uh, I believe Brezhnev was there in the building. Oh, sure. But the 3,000 Canadians you talk about, I, the Soviet fans were stunned. I don't think they'd... They didn't expect this kind of reaction, and they sat very sort of stone-faced, and they quite didn't quite know what to make, well, you make of all to. these Canadians. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't. All they could do was whistle. If you ever got up and started cheering like that, you could probably find yourself in, uh, in uh, Siberia. Everything was so controlled with them. Well, these crazy Canadians, I mean, the Red Army didn't know what to do. They didn't know whether to shoot them, <laughs> take them out. And the most hilarious thing was a guy from Montreal with a bugle. Yes, I And remember. they would go up and try to get it, and he'd pass it down to the Canadians, and so they'd just pass it up and down the aisles. And 
No, they were fabulous. They were fabulous. You're sitting here with passion. You remember it like it was yesterday, but you've said in the past, one of your great regrets is you didn't enjoy the moment or moments. Why? Because it, uh, the intense pressure to win, especially when we lost in Vancouver, we got to go over there and win the three of the last four games, and then we lose the first game in Moscow. And I, I remember saying to my wife, if we don't win the last three games, we're going to be known as losers for the rest of our lives. And so it was paramount uh, that we win that series. And even w when it was tied 5-5, they come down and said, if it ended up in a, uh, in a tie, because there's going to be no overtime played, they were going to claim victory because at this point they'd score more goals than we did. And I think that was one of the reasons that impelled me to, I, I just felt I had to get on the ice. I just felt that I, I, I should be out there. And of course, uh, stood up, started yelling at Peter Mohavlich, and thank goodness Peter thought it was a coach yelling at him, and <laughs> now it's history. All right, you say you gotta get on the ice. Before the last game, though, the 6-5 goal is the most memorable. What about the 6-5 goal <laughs> in Game 7, uh, the penultimate game? Uh, that your best goal? The best goal I ever scored in my life. I just, I knew it was going to be my last shift when I went out there, and I knew a tie was no good. It was all over. And <clears throat> got the puck from Serge Savard, and there was four. I could see. There was two forwards and two defensemen back. And I was not Gilbert Perot. He did the end-to-enders. I never did that. Uh, but beat all four of them, and... Uh, and as I was going down, uh, Vasiliev cut me down, and I just knew I had to go under the crossbar because Trechak was into his uh, little crouch and went right under the crossbar. And I'll tell you what, man. Now, that's game seven. Oh, I know. Now, game eight is very different. You know, the pressure's even, uh, I don't want to say more intense, but it was a very different situation. Oh, no question. Eight. No question. But if I don't score that one, the game, last game means nothing. But the thing that irks me, you know, you get Foster Hewitt. Henderson makes a wild stab <laughs> for it and falls. I, I mean, how you know that a hockey player really wants to hear that? <laughs> thank goodness I put it in the net, and everybody forgot that I made a wild stab at it and fell. Do you ever think, Paul, what would have happened to the Canadian psyche had you not scored uh, in the final game with 34 seconds to go? Well, there's no question about it. Uh, I mean, Russia would have taken over the world, the United States and Canada. Uh, we'd have never survived. <laughs> a friend of mine, when the Berlin Wall came down that day, he phoned me and said, Henderson, they never survived that last goal. That was a last nail in the, the communist coffin. So, uh, I mean, that's uh, obviously uh, hyperbole, but sounded awful good to me. Paul, have you had contact uh, with players? Obviously, you've met one or two in the 40 years since, but... Uh... Well, Trechak, for the most part. Trechak speaks pretty good English now, and we do a, a show together every summer, and got to know him really well. He's really a, really a nice guy. I mean, I'm glad I got to know them, because they're no different than us. I mean, they're trying to keep their wife happy, raise some kids, and now a lot of them have grandchildren like I do, and so... They're just really neat guys, but in 72, we hated them with a passion. We should have hated their system, not them, but took it out on them. That's a very good point. Uh, your teammates, 14 of them, went back uh, recently to Moscow. You were not able to go. You're battling leukemia. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I take it one day at a time. I'm uh, very fortunate. i got the greatest wife in the world, and she's been taking really good care of me. I'm in a clinical trial now in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And it seems to be working. My face is back to normal again. Uh, at this point, I'm trying to stay alive long enough that they find a cure. At this point, there's no cure for what I have. And so, uh, you know, because of my faith, I, I, I just take today. Uh, and, uh, and I can honestly say I have no fear of dying. I really believe I know where I'm going. And there's an inner peace that uh, comes with that. And so I get up in the morning, and this is going to be a good day. And if I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to take another shot at tomorrow. We are sitting on the 43rd floor high above Toronto City Hall. This is where you return to the celebration. I remember it well. You said you didn't enjoy the moments because of the pressure. What was it like? Did you enjoy this moment when the pressure was removed and you returned to Canada? Well, it certainly was a great moment. We, we were just dead tired. We were just exhausted when we come down. It was a miserable night that night, but those crazy Canadians, we just could not believe that they would come out in the rain and be there. And so, a wonderful, wonderful experience. It, it really, really was. And I think that maybe give us the first uh, instance that we knew how much this country got involved and, and how enthusiastic they were about our winning. And uh, I remember it like yesterday. 
It's a great point you bring up because I don't think anyone that was in Moscow, either those of us covering it or fans or players, had any idea the, the social media didn't exist like it does today. Oh, exactly. You had no idea how big this was at all. No question. I mean, I knew it was a big goal. I mean, you know, but no, would never in a million years believe that it's kept the uh, uh, around this long. Like my wife said this week. Paul, I'm getting sick and tired of seeing you in the paper and on television, you know. Uh, but uh, saying that very facetiously, but it's it amazes to this day. Like it, it just seems to. It's the one thing that seems to have gotten bigger as time goes on. And this, uh, you know, everybody. I I can't believe how many people young come kids, up to me. Oh, the, yeah. the, the 15, 16 year olds, long before they were ever the twinkle in their parents' eye, they remember this uh, this series. Exactly, exactly. I, and people do projects on me all the time, and I get. You know, I still get letters from people. They want to know things or call me on the telephone or get emails. And so it's uh, because kids in school have to do, uh, you know, national heroes do. And, and so I'm often chosen that. And so I guess I'm in the history books and that kind of stuff. So but it's, it's really neat now that my grandchildren are into it, too. It's really neat. My, I go downstairs, my seven year old grandson. <laughs> and we're going downstairs to play mini sticks in the basement like we always do. So we're walking down the steps, and he says to me, I'm Paul Henderson, and I'm playing for Team Canada. Who are you? <laughs> what is it like to be Paul Henderson or if to? To have been Paul Henderson on that uh, on that subject for the last 40 years. Well, it's been a great ride. There's no question about it. I had to make a decision. Either I had to run from this or embrace it, and I decided that I was going to embrace it and enjoy it. And it was a really good decision. But the thing that Brian is really good. People come up to me, and initially they don't ask me questions. They want to tell me where they were, what they were doing, and how it impacted them. And everybody has got a story, and everybody loves hearing stories. And so I have never tired of hearing stories. And you get different ones all the time. It's unbelievable. After 40 years, I will hear new stories. Never heard that one before. You know, it would be easy to say enough already when you're asked the same question for the, you know, 10 millionth time. You've embraced it, though. Well, I have in the sense that I feel a responsibility. Like I said, I'm very proud to be a Canadian, very proud to have represented my country, and I've really tried to handle myself well uh, in terms of trying to be a role model, and, uh, and I've always said I want to finish well. And so I've taken that as a responsibility, and I've tried to use that uh, in, in a positive way. We've raised, I, I would hate to imagine how many thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars we've raised by selling Paul Henderson uh, jerseys. You know, I'll put them on and then whoever buys it uh, uh, sign the jersey. So there's been a lot of very positive things that have come out and allowed me to do. Do a lot of motivational speaking. My wife and I speak at marriage conferences. And of course, I've run a men's ministry for 29 years and uh, know I've impacted a lot of people's uh, lives. My book, there's a whole section in there about 20 people talk about how that with through mentoring and get one of our groups, how we've impacted them. And so when you read that and you know you've had a positive impact, it, it makes you feel pretty good. You were a class act when I met you more than 40 years ago. Uh, you're, you're every bit as classy. Uh, I know I speak for the country. We wish you nothing but, uh, but good health and continued happiness. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you, my buddy. Thanks, Thank buddy. you. Thank you.